Okay, well, I think we're already recording. So uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's program uh, by the Create Energy Center. Um, today, we're going to be taking a look at uh, supervisory control and data acquisition systems and a human machine interface. Uh, our, our presentation today is going to be delivered by Dr. Kevin Cooper and Professor Chris Bakley from Indian River State College. Uh, Indian River State College is uh, sort of the lead institution on our SCADA grant uh, and has been uh, responsible for uh, both developing an open source SCADA platform as well as some SCADA curriculum and several activities to use with students. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to uh, Kevin to kick off the show. Thank you, Ken. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Morning for many, I'm sure, as well. This has been a really timely project. Today, we're talking about SCADA systems and the human machine interface. For those new to this, uh, SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition. And a very, very important part of this whole presentation is the human machine interface. Ken's going to get back to it later on in the presentation, but there's a website where there's all sorts of modules. We're really focused in on module four today, which is the human machine interface. And I'm going to share my screen for a minute to just walk us through a little bit of module four before I turn it over to uh, Chris. And uh, module four, can everyone see my screen okay? Just nod your head, Chris, if you can. Okay. So module four has every module set up the same way. Uh, Create does a fantastic job of laying out the learning outcomes and how the module fits into the big picture and everything. Module four talks about the human machine interface and you have very specific objectives there, but I wanna jump ahead to a couple of slides just to show us the evolution of this and why it's important and why it's important towards the future. And I wanna just tell a real tangential story. So this is a real good example of where we've come. We've come from local push button control to, I remember when, and we still teach it to touch screens to workstations that are, were very complicated and complex. And we get into a couple of pictures of these later on where it's just hard unless you're an expert operator to digest and understand everything on this screen to where we're now, which is super, super intuitive to the Gen Z and next generation, the digital natives, which is a interface that is you can dig into and you can dig into and dig into and get the data you want and it's very intuitive to the older the younger generation but not as intuitive to the older generation so this is very important module in terms of making sure everyone is at the same level and i just want to tell a really really quick tangential story yesterday i, I was honored uh, i got to go to patrick space force base which is one of two space force bases and it's where they do a majority of the launches of a uh, the commercial fleet. So, and I didn't realize this for everyone on the call, everyone knows the Virgin Galaxy and Blue Origins and SpaceX. There's 31 private companies that are launching at a Kennedy Space Center right now. They do about 31 launches a quarter. They've done 31 launches in the last two quarters. So they're doing a launch every, there's, there's seven companies that launch humans into space and 31 commercial companies that launch folks into space. And I actually got to meet with the head of space. His name's Brigadier General Purdy. And I asked him what one of his biggest challenges are for his incumbent workforce and his new workforce. And to my shock, he said SCADA systems. He said, we have a complete disunderstanding of SCADA systems, how to apply them, how operators use it. We're turning into a commercial airport. We have, you know, seven launch platforms and 31 companies that all want to use it. They all have a ton of sensors, but they all don't communicate with each other. And there's so many different vendors and so many different, and we need to commonize the SCADA interface. So as we talk about it for energy today, and Chris talks about it, it is really, really important to think about it in a much broader perspective because it's it's in most industries, we're talking about the human machine interface and how it applies. Uh, the only other example I'll talk about, because I it came up recently with uh, energy, I work a lot in with utility scale, is they really, really, really have to train their operators on the cyber aspects of the uh, uh, interfaces. Because what's happening from a cyber hacking perspective is the hackers are trying to stay below the noise so the operators don't pick up on it. So they really, all the operators really have to look at the uh, trends and come up with their own methods, analyze the trends. And what Chris is going to show you today, and he's done a tremendous job of embedding systems and making it a user-friendly interface, is a couple labs that make 
you know, your technician's very familiar with the SCADA interface. So I'll stop and uh, anyone who's monitoring the chat can tell me if there's any questions or anything and turn it over to Chris. Chris? Thank you very much. Okay, so sounds like no questions. Okay, so we can move on here. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Perfect. Okay. So we'll just go through a couple of quick definitions just to make sure. I think everyone's already probably familiar with SCADA, but uh, we'll just go through a couple of definitions just to make sure things like post tests are satisfactorily uh, filled out. Um, okay. So as mentioned before, here's the, the acronym. And the basic idea is that it's uh, to enable monitoring and issue of process commands. Now the software that, uh, that uh, I wrote really focuses more on the monitoring side than the issuing of process commands. Uh, and, and we'll see that as we, we go through that. Uh, and as Kevin mentioned, there is pretty much these days not an industry that SCADA doesn't touch. So it's manufacturing, utility, industrial, food and beverage production, all those sorts of things. Uh, you're going to see SCADA. And the idea is that um, it's a, as we're going to, as we're going to talk about with HMI, it's a, a allowing humans to monitor and control automation processes. So there's a kind of a human machine interaction. Um, and there's many different uh, functions, allow control and programming of equipment, visual, visualizing data trends, monitoring data, and so forth. So that's kind of the background. Like, as I mentioned, I think most people are already familiar with SCADA, so I just kind of wanted to briefly go over that. Now to talk about specifically the SCADA platform that we've created. So some of the background on this is uh, commercial systems have a different aim or goal than maybe we have in the classroom. Because myself, I'm a teacher. I, I, I still write software sometimes uh, you know, on and off, but uh, I still have this, the same concerns a lot of you have is that it's gotta be uh, simple enough that the students can actually complete it. It's gotta be straightforward. Uh, there's got to be quick um, setup times. And so that was kind of the things that we kept in mind. Uh, also issues like, do you have to involve IT in installing the software, that kind of stuff. So the actual system itself, it's web-based and uh, it is an open source platform. We have a hosted server. And so you're welcome to, to use that to point your students. So again, because it's web-based, you can just point them to a URL. The URL is actually included in the labs, and, and I'll pull the lab onto the screen here in a minute. Uh, but because it's open source and it's a pretty simple, easy software uh, install for your IT department, maybe some of you, if you're not familiar with installing web-based software, it might be a little bit more difficult. But uh, I think most of, most people, if you if you wanted to run your own private server for your own students, you could. Now, there's kind of two modes that can be used in. We're going to mostly focus on the labs, but uh, one of the functions was meant to uh, make it so that it could actually capture real world data. So we'll see at the end that actually uh, Madison College actually is streaming data from a real functioning um, uh, uh, solar farm onto the server. And right now we have it's, it's capturing one site, but we're working on more talk about that later, but just to, to let you know that uh, this is not just lab only, this is actually capturing real world data. Okay, so um, let me just, so there's currently uh, two labs. Now I'm going to go through them kind of quickly, but um, uh, in the real world, when students start working on it, it's always going to take them considerably longer. So I'm going to go through it, you know, relatively fast because I've, I've, I've done these a million times. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, when students do these, it's going to be considerably slower. It might take them, you know, three, four times as long to, to go through them. So the labs are actually available on the Create website. So I went ahead and downloaded the HMI lab here. Let me make this large enough so everyone can see. So the focus of the HMI lab is two parts. One is actually using an HMI system, but uh, in working with um, uh, Brian, who helped create these labs, um, 
So he has a lot of industry experience. My experience is actually mostly writing software and I actually worked for a company previously writing SCADA software. So we kind of had, when we were creating these two different views of, of the problem. Uh, and a lot of his, so on my side, when I'm writing software, I'm, I'm getting a, you know, a planned out HMI already, but he sort of mentioned that a lot of the value in the lab is going through and actually planning the HMI. So the first part of the lab is actually, hey, we've got some data points here. So we've got different devices. We've got a, a battery, inverter, solar panel, and a weather station. And the students are to sit down on uh, just with pen and paper and sketch out what an HMI should look like. Now there's some PowerPoint slides that uh, go through. And the, again, this is available on the, on the uh, actually on the, on the website. And uh, they'll learn some best practices for creating their HMI. And once they have that skill set, they go through here. And the basic idea is that there's certain top level things that you want to see. So for example, uh, on the weather station, most of these things aren't really going to directly impact um, the output of the solar farm. However, obviously, something like irradiance, that's probably something you want to see at the top level. Wind speed and direction, yeah, maybe you want to capture that for some data mining, but in reality, uh, that might be something you want to see in a more detailed view. So the idea with the lab is to create a two-level HMI where you have a uh, top level where you view the most important information. And kind of spoiler alert, the idea is that the most important information is probably going to be irradiance and power. And they go through that, and then they go uh, have a discussion with the other students and so forth. So to save a little bit of time, what they can then do is actually have a reference uh, HMI that we have. And so here's the high level. It kind of shows the network and other things like that. And so they'll have a weather station and inverter. And then this is going to be the more detailed version. Okay. And then uh, we've left this sort of open ended. The students can go into Microsoft Paint or because I know the reality of things, uh, they can actually download the lab files. So I'm at the, uh, the home page here. And again, it's uh, the URL is listed inside of the lab. And so we can download the lab files and uh, I already have them downloaded and I'll just kind of give you a quick. So just a couple of PNG images here. Uh, and we'll, we'll upload those in a second. Now with the lab itself, the students actually, uh, so as I mentioned, we are collecting real world data, but for the labs to keep the labs consistent, there's a simulation portion and I'll go over that. But to keep in mind, uh, the students should be obviously getting the same results for each uh, run through the lab and between students. So we have simulated data, but uh, if you want and you have your, your system tied in, you could maybe come up with some sort of lab on your own where you have real world data. So each student actually gets their own virtual environment. So to start, they just start a new lab session and then they get a little message here that the, uh, the lab session started. And uh, I'll kind of quickly go through the lab here. So the first thing that we're gonna focus on is the level one display. So go ahead and create a new location. And so just before, let's say for example, you've got one uh, solar farm on your main campus, we just call it main campus. We'll browse over to the image and I'm reading the lab off screen here. So the lab says to use this image and so we'll go ahead and use that image, create it and then we're presented with a new lab, okay? Now in the real world, a lot of these systems let you design these uh, uh, from scratch, we sort of cheated a little bit and we have a background image and then that makes the, the lab a little bit easier to get through. Uh, that way it's kind of uh, almost like a paint by numbers. They know exactly where to, to drop everything. So then we can go ahead and create a couple of devices here. So we're gonna create one for the inverter and one for the weather station. And I'll just go through the type the, uh, these are just settings that they have to enter. They don't really have to particularly understand them. There's just, uh, it's almost like a, a network address. And I'll talk about some of these other things, but basically it uses a driver system. And so uh, you can actually write drivers and we have some drivers already available for if you want to interact with a real world system. Uh, but in the simulator, we just have a dummy driver called the basic inverter. And then we'll add a couple of data points. So they'll want to look at the maybe the power and the status of the system. Something like the, the actual fan running on the system. That might be a little bit too, too detailed for a top level. Here. Okay, so we've got a 
little picture of an inverter, and then we'll create another device. And so this one's going to be for the weather station. So this is going to be connected to a different RTU. So this will use the weather station driver. And we want temperature and a radiance. So you'll see no data is being captured just yet. So as I mentioned before, that's why we have the simulator. So we click the simulator. It'll open up in a new tab. That way they don't lose their work. And they just go ahead and simulate some data. Go back over here. and. Here we go. And let me do this. I'm just going to go ahead and make the screen a little bit larger. Hopefully, everyone can see that. And so we've got some uh, irradiance and a, a temperature. And as I mentioned, this is going to be the same each time because it's simulated data. And so this is uh, OK for um, a certain function if you just want to look at high level data, but maybe you want, you want to be able to have a second level view. And so that's the next part of the lab is to actually go through and create a new location. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then the name of that will be, uh, we'll just focus on the weather station. And as I mentioned before, these were supposed to be images that they could uh, sketch out on pen and paper. But to make it the lab consistent, uh, once they've sketched on paper, discussed it with uh, the other students, then they can actually use these uh, images that we've supplied. So go ahead and do that. And then now, if, uh, say, for example, they wanted to dig into the weather station data, we could go over the locations and now go to the weather station. And uh, I'll go ahead and it should be obvious that we could refill these in. So we'll create three new devices. I'll go try to go through this quick and not waste too much time. So the first one's going to be And for the sun, we will, oops, and so we want the weather station driver and a radiance only. Perfect. The next one was wind. Yep. And finally, re, uh, device related to heat and humidity. Flip back over and generate some data again. And there we go. So overall, the basic idea with that lab is to have the students given a set of uh, data points over here, is that they sketch it out. They have kind of a conversation back and forth on what a good two-level hierarchy design should be. And then finally, they actually implement that in a system where if I'm looking at the High level um, data, uh, that's one perspective. And then maybe you want to dig in to something a little bit more detailed. You can go into the more detailed data. Okay. So that's that lab. And I'm thinking we're doing good on time that we can actually talk a little bit about the, uh, the other lab that we created. So any questions on that before I move on? OK. So we have a, another lab, and this Chris, one just is- Just to let you know, we haven't seen anything in the chat window yet, but a reminder for people, if you have questions as we go along, feel welcome to type them in the chat. Perfect. Um, I have a question. Um, Chris, these pictures, did, did you draw them in like, say, paint or something like that, and then you import them? I mean, can you make your own pictures? Yeah. So. Uh, Actually, Brian, um, 
So the uh, so there's the background images themselves. We actually just created those in PowerPoint. The lab itself states, uh, I think, Microsoft Paint, but uh, just any image. So it can either be, I think the software accepts PNGs, GIFs, and um, JPEGs, uh, and I'm sure maybe potentially other, other types as well. And so that's the background image. And then the icons themselves, I just went out to Google Images, and they have a search where you can search for open source images or you know open licensed images. So I didn't actually create these little icons myself. I just kind of found open, uh, open access things. So you could you could potentially create new icons as well. How do you import them into your system once you create them? So uh, it would be it would be you would have to do a code commit. So it's not a, a highly dynamic system. It's not meant to be like a full SCADA replacement. Uh, so it's not like a, um, a building SCADA from scratch. A lot of this is, is set in place. So what you do is a, a code commit and add it to it and then it automatically show up in the drop down. And that's that's something the instructor could do themselves, or is that would they need a little help with that? They would most likely need help, uh, but once it's in the system, it'll be in the system forever. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then let me hop over to the chat. Let's see if I see anything. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, and I'll go through this next one here. Let me just very briefly. Let me just double check, make sure I'm hitting all the. Uh, the questions here. Okay, perfect. Uh, so now I'll go through the uh, other lab. So we have this lab here. And then this one's more, um, uh, less on the design side and more on the uh, troubleshooting, viewing of alarms and uh, SCADA in, in general. So the idea with this lab is that uh, the student goes through and sets up the HMI again. And this one's a little bit more structured. They don't have to go through and, and, and Microsoft Paint or anything and, and sketch out stuff themselves. We, we sort of supply all that already. Um, and then they're monitoring the system. So they set up some alarms, they're monitoring the system and then they see an alarm is triggered. And then the idea is that you go through and there's a drop in power output. And the most obvious reason would be, you know, just it's just cloudy, but uh, they have other things that they they want to look for. So the idea is that there's a common event, like it's just cloudy, uh, but they have to search for other potential events, like maybe the system, uh, the inverter itself is overheating, and then go through and kind of think, okay, which is more likely, just the event that is just cloudy now, and we'll we'll run through that. So again, they get their own virtual environment. So all we have to do is start a new lab session and that just clears everything out. By the way, as a side note, um, the, uh, if, if the students mess up at any time, they can always just go back to the home screen, start new lab session, and that clears everything out. Something you have to be a little bit careful of because uh, you know if they're in the middle of a lab and they do that, they will have to restart the lab. There's no like saving in the middle of it, but just to, um, just to kind of be aware of that. And, uh, and I, I'm not sure if I touched on this, but really the, the target audience, just to, to be clear on this, this is not meant for like engineering students. It's, uh, I'm, I'm sure most people on the call, this is gonna be more for your uh, community college technician level students. Okay, so let's keep on going through here. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go through that process again here and we're gonna create a new location. Stick with that image. And then we'll create a device and we'll have the inverter. And in this case, we'll also look at the fan. Again, the idea is that uh, something like a low probability event, like the fan fails and it overheats, you, uh, the students still need to look at that, but realize that it's a low probability event. And then we'll go through and create the weather station again.
And then uh, just to let you know, these are context sensitive. So if I click the weather station and I have the map, or I'm sorry, the, um, the navigation up here, it's going to be different than if I click the inverter. So the idea is that if I click the inverter and then click to create an alarm, it's going to create an alarm for that inverter. Okay. Just something to be clear about. And so what we can do is we can go ahead and create an alarm. And the idea is that, okay, we want a low power output alarm. And if the data point power is less than 500 watts, we get a notification. Great. So now we go back and we open up the simulator to simulate steps. And we get some data here. Uh, so it's it's charging uh, a system and, and here's the power outage. And then, and then this is kind of cutting off here, but this is the temperature and irradiance. And now step two, well, it's cloudy and We get a dip in power and we get a little red dot here. So then the student goes through and they investigate it and they go to uh, the alarms and they say, ah, okay, so the, uh, the low power alarm was triggered. Now the next step, the idea is that, okay, how, what happened? Then they go ahead and dig into that and I'm just scrolling through here. So the system kind of has the live data and then the historical data. So right now we're viewing the database, which has the live data, but they want to go back and uh, dig into the historical data. So now let's go in. We'll just do the last step so that the alarm is cleared out and uh, the system's back to normal. So I want to view the historical data for the inverter. So what we do is we click the inverter, go to the historian. And as you can see here, there's a bunch of different search parameters. So in this case, I could look at different things like uh, the power outage. So I just want to plot the power. We can see very clearly here there's a dip. It's a very defined dip, just to make it so that you know the, the students, it's not subtle. That they should be able to spot that. And they can also look at the fan, but it's a little bit less clear. And if we actually look at the values, the RPM, let's say it's a variable speed fan, that's um, not, not terribly interesting. And now let's look at the actual weather station's historical database. And let me hop back over to the lab just to make sure I'm being consistent here. And I think we just plot the irradiance. And we can see here there's a very big dip. And I think we can go through with temperature. Temperature, it's a little bit less clear. Uh, maybe the air temperature didn't really change. Now, unfortunately, I don't have Excel installed on this computer. Uh, for practical purposes, I had to, to um, go through and do something else. But uh, then the last step here you can see is that if uh, Excel happens to be installed on that computer, then they can go through and actually plot these. And the last step is actually to fill out uh, an incident report. So they go through everything that they found and say, hey, we, um, uh, we found that Yes, there's other these other data points, and maybe there was some things that didn't look quite correct. But most likely, there was some sort of association between the power out it, um, the power output of the inverter and the weather that day. Uh, now, just to let you know, so you can actually download this data, and we'll get into that in a little bit once we get to the more of the um, non-lab side. But inside the historical database, if I go back to the inverter in the historian, there's a download button. And so this will actually download the data as a CSV file. So if anybody's worked with CSV, uh, Excel can open them. Essentially, just they're just a text file with commas separating out the different data values. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to download everything because it's a small file. And I can actually view the simulation data here. Okay, so this is just a CSV file, and then we can see all the different things here. And you can make plots or do your own data analysis and so forth. Um, now, if you want to, so any any questions about that lab? I know I went through it kind of quick, but the basic idea is that the first lab is about designing an HMI and then actually implementing it. And then the second lab is more about uh, monitoring a system and then going through and troubleshooting and being able to use the historical database and, and that sort of stuff.
Uh, so any hey, questions? Chris, I, I have a question for you. Um, you. You opened the CSV file kind of quick, and I couldn't couldn't quite tell. But uh, is there a, is there a way to tell when you're just looking at numbers in a CSV file? Uh, what the columns of data represent, whether the power is measured in watts or kilowatts, for example, and whether the temperature is in Fahrenheit or Celsius, or is there some sort of a, a companion file that has that information, or would it show up in the SCADA dashboard? Um, so in the in this uh, in the dashboard system itself, it does say the units, but I think in the um, once it's actually downloaded, I can't remember if I had it or not the units, but that's definitely. Good question. Let me let me open it up. Oh no, and I remember why now. Yeah, because it's all kind of so it's just the the, the data itself, and there was no real really to put it. Unless yeah, right, yeah, right. Kind That's of, I kind of figured. So I was just curious if there's a way, but but the units correspond to the units that are in the SCADA dashboard. So that's where you you'd go back to look, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And actually. Uh, that, and and I, I should, um, maybe the next step is I can show the your live system, and then we can actually talk about some of the, the implementation details about that. Sure, sure. Are there any questions about the labs themselves? Okay, Chris, so I, can I do a one minute tie in before you go to the live system? Yes. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen real fast? Yeah. So let me stop sharing. Okay. So Chris did a really good job talking about the two labs and the labs, just for a reminder, are designed to complement the module itself, module four, which is human machine interface, which goes from talking about a very uh, poor design with lots of data overload and unrealistic to the fact that there's design standards. And so as you're building it, you can talk about how there are design standards. Here's a module that's built similar to design standards to just show the critical information, be consistent in layout. And then you, the, what Chris's labs do a fantastic job is, is in displaying the hierarchy of events, like exactly the order of what Chris did, the overall situation is, and then the diagnostic that he just got into the alarm. And the example there in the PowerPoint is a PV system. And then you go into the performance and data tools Etc. And so he does a really good job of tying his labs to the curriculum that's there, and the, the labs are to complement the. And then we go into what high performance is and how to use the data. So it's a really good tie-in midway through it. Chris, how long did you say it takes per lab in terms of students? About fifty minutes an hour. Sure. Yeah, somewhere in that range. So what end, always ends up happening is uh, with students, they go through one step at a time, and and then. Uh, they're not going to type that fast. They're not going to go through. There's a lot of design. There's a lot of question to answer and a discussion that happens in, in between. So it's in that general range in, in practice. And I just wanted to make sure before you show the live system that we understood the tie in between the curriculum and the labs and then to see if there's any questions on how to embed in your program. Because one of the beautiful things Create did with this whole project was break it down into modules so that if you only want to embed the human machine interface module, or you only want to embed the other modules you can. So wanted to make sure everyone was comfortable with how to embed the various modules before we move forward and to make sure there's no questions there. I have a question about the uh, students that did the labs. Were they doing them at home or did they do them as a group at the, at the college? So, Chris, to take you through, we're just now finishing the development of it. And so we haven't really done a lot of beta testing with students yet. Okay. But Theoretically, students could, could do it at could home, do, right? Um, yeah. So if there was an online class, uh, because it's all simulated data, it uh, they could theoretically do this from home. Okay, thanks. Chris, I have a question for you. Is it possible for... Uh, us as instructors or maybe for like for, for you and me or some of the other instructors to generate additional simulated data sets. Um, that is and, a and I'll, I'll give you a specific example of why I think that might be interesting. You know, like this one here where the power cuts out because of, of the low irradiance that that's like an easy one to diagnose. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we sometimes see happen here in Wisconsin is if a system isn't designed correctly, uh, in the middle of January, when it gets really, really cold, 
the, uh, the, the voltage increases on those solar modules. And they, and they might increase to the point that they exceed the input window on the inverter. Um, so you could imagine a situation where the power output isn't correlated with the irradiance, but actually is correlated to the temperature. And it's kind of counterintuitive. It, what happens is it, it gets really cold when you'd be expecting to make a lot of electricity. And then all of a sudden you lose all your production because it got so cold that the voltage went outside of the inverter window. Um, so so I, there, I bring this up because we've actually seen systems fail this way and it would be an interesting scenario to develop a set of simulated data and have students sleuth that out instead of us just telling them the story about it, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm, uh, so Kevin, did you have any more to, uh, to lean into the next part? Nope, I'm, I'm good. And you're going to get the Ken on the next part. So, yep, I'm good. Good question, Ken. Ken okay, forward. absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Don't nobody, I don't want anybody to freak out. There's code. So, I'm, by the way, I'm, so I'm computer science background. As I mentioned before, I, I uh, used to work for a company actually writing SCADA software. And so that's kind of my background is, um, and I sort of assumed that I wasn't, um, I'm not an elect electrical engineer. I knew that I wasn't going to realistically come up with the different types of scenarios that, you know, technicians in the real world uh, might see. So what I, I created is uh, some scripts and I'm not really expecting anybody here to be able to like look at a script like this and modify it. But the idea is that uh, in this one, it generates data with jitter and these other sorts of things. And then it outputs these data files. And so um, if anybody has any ideas that they want to uh, do a lab, either you could work with your own computer science department, or I could modify this script to pretty much do whatever. And then the idea is that each step generates a bunch of data. So remember earlier when I had the uh, the simulator and it has all that. And so it, it has data points and jitter and dates and times and all that sort of stuff. So it should be, uh, because I set it up in a way where a script generates the data like this, it should be pretty trivial to, if you have some scenario that you wanna come up with, uh, we could, should be able to generate new labs pretty quickly. Oh, cool. That's kind of a, an interesting idea. I can think of a few scenarios that would be neat to simulate. So we'll follow yeah. up on that. For sure. Yeah. And it Perfect. has that convergence element with other uh, areas of the college. Computer, I love the computer science convergence you did there, Chris. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For schools that have a, a strong CS department, that would be a nice uh, tie-in. Exactly. And so all they would have to do is essentially um, uh, generate these these files in a certain format. I have an example script that I, and again, it's, it's it looks confusing. It's actually not that. A lot of it's doing little things like adding jitter, you know, and... Uh, and following like a sine wave over a season, you know, things like that, um, that just kind of, but the, the meat of the code itself is actually not that complicated. So, uh, and then actually, if you want to uh, come up with, so in our case, we, we just had like a simple inverter. There's uh, these data schemas and I'll make this larger. So, so like, for example, we have the basic inverter. And so if you want to add new data types, all we have to do is come up with uh, this. So it would have the, and this is kind of goes back to what you mentioned before. So the power would be a number measured in Watts uh, versus this, in this case, um, we also have discrete values, whether it's charged, discharging and so forth. And you can see the, uh, the also energy one that we, we worked on earlier in another company, um, uh, Victron Energy. And so, Lots, lots of flexibility for making custom things. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any, ide any ideas where you want to come up with something custom, just uh, we'll, we'll do our best to work with you. Okay, so that's, um, that's on the lab side. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there's kind of two purposes. One is for coming up with labs for uh, the students to go through in different scenarios and, and the, the one we showed earlier was, you know, very much manufactured, but it was the idea is it's to help te technician level students. And uh, there's another side to it is having this actually run in the real world and collect data. And so we've been working with Ken and we actually have a system here. So let's go to, there we go, Madison College, uh, Reedsburg. And so this one's from a company uh, called Also Energy. Let me make this larger. And we can actually see here. By the way, uh, and I know this is one of the questions. Anybody who wants to to help the system along, obviously, you know, you can do things like um, 
uh, create documentation, you can report bugs, you can, uh, one of the things is icons. I could not find a good weather station open source icon. So this one gets a little bit blurry. It's not the greatest. If, if anybody has some good art skills that I could use a maybe a little bit of better of weather station, um, but that's kind of as a, as a side note. And Ken, can you can you confirm that it's raining out? And uh, well, I'm not in Reedsburg at the moment. I'm in Madison. Reedsburg's about uh, 35 miles to our northwest. But yes, it is light okay. rain, and it's probably mid 40s. Um, okay. So that sounds accurate. And actually, that weather station is a pretty good representation of what we've got out at that site too. It looks pretty much just like that graphic you have. So <laughs> um, yeah, so th those conditions look like our real world conditions today. Um, and it looks like if I'm looking at the blue box, you're showing eight kilowatts of PV power right now. Yes. So that, that system is a hundred kilowatt system. Um, and eight kilowatts would probably be about right because it is completely gray skies and overcast. We are not getting much sun right now at all. So I wouldn't expect much more than that for power output. So I think those numbers look pretty accurate. Okay, perfect. And as before, so this is the live data. You can always go back into the historical data. And uh, as I mentioned before, we use the simulated data for labs because you kind of want to set up a very controlled uh, scenario. But uh, theoretically, you know, if somebody had live data, from, a, from a, a specific event that happened in the real world, we could potentially capture that and put that into a lab as well. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and just download. We've been capturing for, uh, I guess it's been a week and a half now. And so we can actually just go ahead and view that. And uh, it should be obvious what's going on here is that during the nighttime, we don't have anything. And then we go through the day, it's collecting about every 15 minutes, which I think also energy, I think that was kind of their, their recommended limit because I think they didn't want too many API calls overloading their system and then it goes down to zero at night and back and forth and so on. Take a look so, at uh, if you scroll down that data to October 26th I can tell you that was a really sunny day I'd be curious to see what the uh, power maxed out at on October 26th. That was the day that we had the uh, film crew out here from uh, public broadcasting services to make the movie on, on campus. Um, so looks like I'm seeing the max. Of, um, oh, no. Oh, that's the 25th. Uh, oh, go go one more going. day ahead to the to October 26th. There we go. I think we see a 93. That's pretty yeah, good. There you go. So we're pretty close to full power at that point because it's a it's 100 kilowatts DC. So by the time you convert to AC, you have a little bit of loss. So. 93, that, that looks like a reasonable uh, data point for that day. I see, I see an 87 and an 83 there. That's about what we'd expect to see. Looks yeah. great. And by the way, the, uh, just as a side note, that, so I capture these numbers in um, UTC. So don't look too much into that. Uh, so you just have to put a little column in there to offset it to, uh, to your local time. Um, OK. So that was a company. I, I had Apple. one other question on that that data file, Chris. As I as I yeah. look at the CSV file, um, some of those numbers uh, were like whole numbers, and other ones had like twelve decimal points. Is that actually how also energy outputs that stuff, or does that just have something to do with the settings of what what is being displayed in the CSV file? Uh, no, that was. I think that's that's how I'm getting them. I'm I'm dumping it in pretty pretty raw way, so they huh. must. However, they get the calculation, and that's the. Um, that's odd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Having written software myself, what'll happen is that sometimes magically uh, stuff will just happen to be, you know, you'll do some mathematics in the background, and then it'll just happen to to kind of get close enough to a whole number that it interprets it as a whole number, or you know. I, uh, what I found more odd was that also energy was giving you those like you, you know twelve points after the decimal because I guarantee that their hardware cannot <laughs> measure that accurately. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. And actually, what's a, um, uh, what I sort of suspect is that uh, maybe there are some internal calculations that go inside the software. And a lot of times, uh, so not to get too much of the weeds, computers actually have kind of a hard time representing a, a, a base 10 decimal number. A lot of times we use a base two system that's uh, a, a floating point number and conversions back and forth can cause like minor, I guess you'd call them rounding errors. 
And so it'll happen sometimes as a straightforward calculation will end up just a little bit off. And so you'll end up with, with numbers like this. Yeah, and I, I kind of wonder since that's power output, what they're probably actually measuring is the voltage in the current and they're calculating that power and, and yeah. just reporting however many numbers can possibly fit in the field yeah, when I'll, they do I'll that multiplication so step. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this was a, a company that we worked with, also energy, but, uh, uh, and we'll take a step back. So to actually get data, let's say, for example, you have a, a, a solar farm on site at your college or uh, whatever, you know, wherever, and that, that you want to start streaming to the system. So first of all, in general, this is not always the case, but in general, most of these um, manufacturers let you pull data or stream data for free. In the, in the case of one of them that we worked with, uh, they did have a small charge, but would you, Ken, would you say it was a relatively small charge? In the grand scheme of things, yeah, I mean, it was uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> a, a minimal charge for uh, compared to what we, what we have in our budget for that project. Um, and, yeah. and actually, also, Energy uh, manages data for three of our sites, so uh, yeah, you know, we'll be able to get data from from multiple campuses from them. So yeah, so in the in the case where it's not included in free, uh, the 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 actual um, costs tend to be minimal. So the idea is to get data into the system. You um, there are drivers. Now, I've been writing the drivers myself so far. And to be honest, between uh, Enphase, also Energy, and uh, working on a Solar Edge driver, I'd imagine that covers a lot of uh, potential use cases um, for, uh, for most solar farms. Uh, I can give you a sense of how they work. Let me just. So I'll pull up one that's simple. So this is actually, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this. This is actually a company called Vic Victron and they, they make a much, much smaller, like like 100 watt level single solar panels. So that's like if you wanna recharge your RV battery levels level uh, equipment. Um, but it's really not that difficult to, to generally pull from these. There's essentially two ways to pull data from these. And again, I wouldn't expect anybody to write code. A lot of this is that uh, you you know you approach us and say, hey, we've got a, this system, and if it's a system system we've already worked with before, all I'd have to do is modify the script to to you know point to a different API endpoint and so forth. So one way is actually pulling data directly off the device. And you know when we first started this process, historically my working with SCADA and working at the company I did, that's how we always did it is we pulled data directly off of a device. And I assume that was kind of the, the standard method going forward. And so this one right here actually pulls data off of the device. But as we saw with um, also energy and with some of these others is that a lot of them are uh, cloud-based these days. And if I pull up, and it's kind of tough to see here, but this is actually a web API. And so this actually makes life even simpler. At this point, they've already exported the data, so you don't even have to have any sort of firewall access or any other sort of IT level access is that um, they're actually hosting the data in the cloud. So let's say, for example, at IRSC, we have a solar farm. Let's, let's pretend it's an end phase. Uh, we don't actually have to go in through IRSC's firewall to pull that data. We actually just go out to a website, any old plain website, uh, you know, firewall access would typically let, let you through. It's very rare you'd have to ask for an exception from IT. So that's actually made life considerably easier is that we don't have to, in most cases, pull data from devices directly anymore. They, they tend to just as part of the install these days, uh, store data on the cloud. But as, I, as you saw before, with this particular company, Victron Energy, they, uh, they do have it to where you can actually pull it off the, the device itself. And here's some of the data points. This is just to kind of go through and show you that we've pulled from anything from, so. Uh, in this case, we made a, a device driver for this uh, small charge controller. It's you know 10 amp. That's pretty much nothing. So, um, but you get the idea. You could you could attach one panel to that, and just so you could feel like you're contributing to the system and adding data, you could get one of these for 80 bucks and a small solar panel, and uh, requires a little data cable here, and that's really it. You could get going just for that. We've actually gone through and done that, and we attached a Raspberry Pi and uh, one of these controllers and a cable and we're actually able to pull in uh, data through that method. Um, let me go back here. I mean, I'm just making sure I hit all the main points here. Chris, can I add something else? Yes. 
So before I forget, sorry to interrupt you, Chris. Uh, one of the another values of adding your system to this is one, there's several values to it. One, it adds other avenues for students. Uh, again, data science students can add multiple systems and look at them across the nation. Two, you now have real live data like Jennifer wrote in the chat window, like to look during a solar eclipse, they had some interesting results. So you can compare different places in the country. But three, actually, it actually helps on the advancement of the solar world. There's some large utilities that have data from their solar fields across geography, across the US. It's very proprietary. It actually helps them predict and build their fields and understand how much sun they're gonna get with each type of equipment and et cetera. But the rest of the uh, world doesn't have huge geographic data sets to use and, and to look at. And it could be very interesting to your students to understand the strength of solar and why California and New Jersey have such tax credits. They can look at it from their, from the economic side of view. This, this is what it's gonna produce here and pull up a solar field in New Jersey. And this is the tax credit. And that's why it's an economically intelligent decision in New Jersey or California and not right now in Idaho and Missouri. So it, we really, really encourage you to add systems to this. Chris can work with you on adding systems to it, but overall it'll help your programs and it'll help your students really understand the economic side of it. Absolutely, and, I, and, and in my head, it's I think it's gonna be sort of a synergistic effect is that we've created the initial labs and we're starting to now collect initial data. But then the next step would be uh, every once in a while is like, for example, solar eclipse is that we're gonna get data, we're gonna get rare events, we're gonna get some interesting things in here. And once we've captured that data, we can take that, turn that into another lab and then the students uh, learn more. And so it's kind of, they, they kind of go back and forth. And so a lot of schools will have data science programs where they'll be able to capture that. And, uh, you know, we can always work with, with anybody. Um, and so that, I think that's absolutely, uh, you know, perfect is, is that uh, uh, collecting as much data as possible, it's gonna really help feed the labs as well. Uh, in addition to actually just research, helping the, uh, the industry as a whole, because like you mentioned, Kevin, a lot of this is, um, wrapped up in proprietary utilities where, uh, you know, even if they wanted to release the data, it'd be very difficult, you know, because of, uh, you know, just a lot of uh, copy. You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess we can also talk about some of the lessons learned. And so I know actually a few people on the call, we've, we've talked about pulling in data. And I think what we've realized and actually working with Madison um, College was uh, helpful is that to be perfectly honest, it may seem at first, and this is, I guess my, with my background, my thinking was that it was mostly gonna be technical limitations. And actually a lot of it turned out not to be technical limitations, it was more administrative. It was talking to the right people, getting the right access and so forth. And so uh, now that we've got some drivers written, um, uh, again, anybody who wants to work with us, we can help you. And uh, Kevin and Ken, maybe you can kind of chime in on this too, uh, generally, a lot of it's just been getting uh, administrative type access to actually get data from the system more than anything, correct? I think it's important to point out it's a one-way communication as well. There's no ability to control your system, which is a concern from administrative perspective. So we're just trying to pull the data off of whoever has the administrative access to the web portal basically. And it's, is that a common question, Chris, at one point in time? Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's good. You brought that up to note is that at no point will we in any way be able to control your system. And actually, because uh, most of these systems have moved to cloud-based now uh, from a security perspective, I don't want to say, it, you know, nothing's ever impossible, but uh, there's so, it's so many layers removed from your actual hardware. It's basically your hardware exports data, puts it to the cloud and then it's stored in the cloud database. So there's never any direct access. Now, in some cases, if you wanted to, like for example, like this Victron Energy system here, if you wanted to hook up the cables and actually export directly. But for most of the larger systems like um, Enphase and uh, Solar Edge, it just seems like across the board, the, the standard these days is um, web APIs, is data from the cloud. You can see here, they'll actually have a URL that you would hit to actually pull that data. So it's never actually touching your system directly. So Chris, I know you've uh, you've you've yeah. written a driver for Enphase systems, and that's a that's a platform that a lot of community colleges use. I mean, we have it for some of our systems here at Madison College, and it's it's pretty common for uh, residential solar applications. Um, 
And I know you've also written the driver for uh, also energy, which uh, we see a lot more for like ground mount utility scale, kind of like the one at the uh, at the Reedsburg campus that you did. And then you mentioned you're working on one for Solar Edge, which is uh, uh, used for residential and also we see on a lot of commercial applications. So I think, you know, with those three drivers, we probably covered a, a fair amount of the uh, the market share of solar installations that are out there. And if if schools have installations on their campuses that have been, you know, commissioned in the last, say, uh, four or five years, more than likely there's a fair chance that it's probably using one of those uh, three sort of platforms. And, and you might be able to get that API key in order to transmit data into the into the SCADA database. Um, exactly, yeah. It's and, a and nice just way to... of being, being part of the solar network as well, where, you know, it's very nice that we're a small community and there's a small number of us, but it's a very nice way of having it and other people realizing you have it as well. And just to kind of t touch on one thing, just to, to be clear, these drivers, so the examples I showed, I don't expect anybody to, to understand the code, but it was more about the length of them. They're relatively short. I know some people do have some programming background. Uh, so the drivers I wrote specifically were in Python just for practical purposes. That way other, uh, it tends to be an easy language that most people understand. But because these are all web APIs, you can really use any language. So if you happen to know some Java or C Sharp, you know, a lot of languages out there, really most popular programming languages will be able to pull data from your system and then send it to our system. Chris, there's a question in the chat window. Is Fortran a good language to be using? Good for data uh, data analytics. I'll say that. You know, there's, funny no, story. there's no question on it. I know. But you know, funny story that you, you, you actually mentioned that. So the company that I work for writing SCADA software, um, physics equations don't change. Certain, you know, electrical engineering the, the fundamentals don't change. So the roots of that system went all the way back to Fortran. And so there was a lot of Fortran code floating around there for doing all kinds of calculations that, you know, there was no, the calculations haven't changed. So the code didn't change. And so uh, there was a lot of Fortran code and it was a pretty modern uh, SCADA system. That's interesting. You have a tutorial on, on the process of, of making the code uh, not particularly, um, but I, I could maybe do like a, a another session, like a how-to, where we write a simple driver. Thanks. Okay, uh, Ken or Kevin or anybody else, were there any other topics that you maybe wanted to touch on, or something that I maybe for I got. My, my sheet of notes scribbled out here. I, I'm making sure I didn't miss anything, but any topics that you guys wanted to cover? You checked off everything on my list, Ken. Uh, well, I'm just checking the uh, chat window to see if we had any other questions. I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. Um, so I think you've, uh, you, you've given us a lot to think about, Chris. I'm eager to try and get a few of our other sites at Madison College hooked up to the, uh, to the platform. Um, the uh, the Reedsburg site for people that don't know uses bifacial solar panels, so that's uh, would be a nice one to be able to contrast with uh, with solar panels that are single sided and only produce power from the front of the module. Um, and we've got uh, two other sites that uh, hopefully we'll be able to get up onto the database uh, in in the upcoming months, so that we can uh, maybe write a, an activity for students to pull that data and, and analyze and compare and contrast those three sites. Um, the thing that's interesting about them is they have different DC to AC ratios, so they exhibit different uh, clipping behavior on bright sunny days, and you get uh, uh, different uh, performance from the, the three sites. So I think it'll actually be a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, data analytics lesson for students to do. Um, so we may have to do another webinar, you know, in the spring once we have all three of those connected so that people can tap into those uh, historical data sets. Definitely. Uh, Chris, if you didn't, if you did, if if did you have any other content you wanted to share, Chris? Otherwise, I can share a few notes about upcoming programs for uh, uh, the Create Center, just so uh, people are aware. And, and, yeah, and this is Jim. While you're doing that, um, uh, I've got a site at Pueblo Community College uh, just dying to hook up to this. So, are you ready to pull uh, some more data points? 
Yeah, I think so. And I think at the time, the, the, the only limitation was um, uh, just kind of getting our first system up and running. And it just uh, for uh, some some practical reasons, it turned out just Madison turned out to be the easiest. But I, I think, uh, yeah, I think we could start adding others now. Yeah, so they have a Macaco um, Blue Planet inverter. Does that, does that fall under one of your standard <laughs> systems? Yeah, I don't know, but I can, you know, I can, I can talk with uh, whatever, whoever the contact is there, and and we can dig in and see see what we can do to get data out of it. Cool, cool. And that's the one of many to come. So it's going to be a uh, 2022 is going to be a big year for uh, um, these type of uh, fields at colleges. So excited. Very cool. Good work, Chris. Really, really nicely put together. Ken, take it away. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm I'm excited to see if we can get Pueblo and some other schools hooked up too. I'll uh, I'll look forward to that. And I know we've got more installations at Madison College that we'll be adding into the platform as we go forward. Um, for the uh, for the other folks that are on the call or that might be viewing this uh, as a recording. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, what we presented today is just one part of the SCADA curriculum that's been created by Indian River State College. So there are uh, multiple other modules. These are all available on the CREATE website that you can download. That's createenergy.org. Uh, you can see the first three modules here on overview of SCADA systems, uh, components and functionality, and basics of SCADA communications. And uh, the... Uh, lab activities that Chris described uh, are designed to complement these, uh, these SCADA modules. Uh, the other thing to make folks aware of, uh, we do have an upcoming event uh, in uh, another week uh, coming up on November 5th. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Clemens, who is actually uh, with us on the call today from Delaware Technical and Community College, will be presenting a lab activity on solar design using helioscope. And Jennifer, maybe I'd just invite you if you want to say a few words about uh, uh, about the lesson you uh, developed in the, the upcoming webinar. Way to put me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're I'm going to be showing how to use Helioscope, which is a design software for um, creating professional looking proposals. So this is really kind of an activity that I add on after students have been using PV watts. Um, so they've had some experience with some design, they know the components, but what's really interesting about Helioscope, we can uh, model shading. So in that little picture here, you can see the tree is modeled here. You can make them whatever size, but you can also pick your panels, pick your inverters. Helioscope has a really big library. So you can choose, you know, whatever kind of uh, module I don't know. I, everything I've looked for is in there. There's thousands in the in their system. Um, so that's really interesting. And also they uh, do have accounts for free for teachers and students. Um, so I'm going to talk about that as well. So it's, it's a little bit pricey, but they do allow you to extend your free trial through the semester and you can have all your students um, sign up for a free trial. So I'll go through that procedure as well. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the uh, presentation coming up on the 5th. Jennifer, I, I can tell you that a lot of our employers on our industry advisory board use this software, and we've started teaching it in our, uh, in our undergraduate program so that our students are familiar with it when they hit the job market. So uh, I, I, I think that this will be of interest to a lot of folks that have solar programs. So uh, look for that event on November 5th. Um, and then uh, uh, just to let folks know, all of our webinars are recorded, uh, including the one uh, today. So that recording will be made available to everyone. Um, and you can download and view or stream any of our past webinars, uh, again, on the Create Energy website, um, which is uh, just createenergy.org. Uh, with that, I'd just like to uh, thank Chris and Kevin for the presentation today. We really appreciate you taking the time. And thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today. And we hope to see you again uh, on November 5th. And happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Great stuff, everybody. All the best.
Thank you.